that's four sessions behind us and one more to go. And if I may say so, it's one of my very favorite sessions with one of my very favorite moderators, Casey Fleming. He's the president and CEO of Black Ops Partners. And this one is about wake of solar wind securing the supply chain and our critical infrastructure. A um, couple things about Casey, he literally set up the security practice for IBM. Um, he's been rated one of the top security experts uh, by his peers. I mean, just incredible insight. So this is a real treat, folks. Uh, just separate to that, hope you got through the trivia. Winners, you're gonna be announced. Good luck. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Casey. Thanks, Casey, and you are hey, everybody. Thanks, Elizabeth, thank you. And welcome to uh, our audience. We're uh, glad to have you with us today. We've got a pretty strong panel. A lot of horsepower on the panel today. Uh, I will say it's uh, over 150 years worth of experience. They hate it when I say that, but I'll do it anyway. Um, really, what Solar Winds is, they're based in Austin, Texas. It was a significant supply chain attack. They're an IT management and monitoring firm with over 330,000 customers globally. They have an Orion monitoring product that. Uh, uh, SolarWinds claims that only 33,000 or 10% were breached. And then many industrial organizations we found out over the past week uh, reserved a malware payload and, and numerous malware, malware payloads and so on. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our panel. Uh, again, a very strong, very significant uh, group of uh, folks that have a lot of horsepower in cybersecurity. I'd like to introduce J. Michael Daniel, President and CEO of the Cyber Threat Alliance, also with the Aspen Cybersecurity Group. And he was previously cybersecurity coordinator for the Office of the President. Michael led the development of the National Cybersecurity Strategy and Policy. Welcome, Michael. Mark Montgomery, Executive Director of US Cyberspace Solarium Commission, United States and previously United States Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, policy director, and he was also a rear admiral with the U.S. Navy uh, out inside the uh, Pacific Command. He's also a White House fellow assigned to the National Security Council. Welcome, Mark Montgomery. John Davis, VP of Global Supply Chain, or I'm sorry, VP of Global Public Sector for Palo Alto Networks, responsible for cybersecurity initiatives and global policy for the international public sector. He was a major general in the U.S. Army senior military advisor for cyber to the undersecretary of defense for policy. And then you've got uh, yours truly. So welcome to all of our panelists. Very, very glad to have you here. Um, so really, you know, I'd like to frame this whole thing. And, you know, here we are another data breach. Here we are a, a huge data breach. And first I'd like everybody to understand that when you hear of a data breach, most people say, well, that's unfortunate, but they never assign really any, any kind of danger damages uh, and that kind of thing. But let me help you with that. And it's and you guys can use this and, and communicate this within your organizations. Every time the United States or one of our free world partners, one of our allies experiences a data breach, we lose a chunk of America. We lose a chunk of democracy and it will never come back. Um, that's very, very critical that people understand that. So when you hear that somebody was breached, it, well, it didn't, doesn't apply to my company, so I really don't care. Yeah, you kind of do. So SolarWinds surprised us yet again. And what did it show us this time? Something that those of us that have been in the industry quite a while and, and at the tip of the spear, we understand and we forecasted this, but what are we missing this time and how can we change? It, it's clear that our approach to cybersecurity has got to change and it's got to change immediately. And I'm gonna ask our panel from their crow's nest, what do you wanna leave with us today? So. Mark, I'd like to start with you. Did the Cyberspace Sol Solarium Commission predict solar winds? And would the CSC's recommendations, if they were enacted, have averted it? Over to you. So, no, we didn't predict solar winds. I, I think we expressed concern over the security of our supply chain, both IT hardware and software. And we uh, certainly expressed concern over the state of federal, uh, particularly the .gov IT security in terms of had it been properly resourced over the last few years. And then finally, I think we expressed a lot of concern about the public private, the state of public private collaboration and the uh, speed with which we can exchange information. And there's two levels of this. There's the general infrastructure, but then the very, the much, I think more important and 
critical to this case, telecom and cloud service provider infrastructure, the ability of the intelligence community to rapidly exchange information with, with them. So we, we discussed all those things, but I don't think we sat there and said, you know, a major supply chain problem's coming that's gonna hit 18,000 networks. I, I do think we generally had a model, it had a pretty dystopian vision. If you read the first two pages of our report, it's really dystopian written by Peter Singer. Um, and what our solutions have done, first of all, I wanna make clear, um, we were easily the most plagiaristic commission ever, uh, you know, enabled. Uh, you know, we had 82 recommendations. If five of them were unique, I'd be surprised. And I'm proud of that. There's a lot of good cyber recommendations out there that have been made by, uh, by task force that the Obama administration and Bush administration had done before us. And if you go all the way back to a project that I, that I worked at the National Security Council with my boss, Richard Clark, uh, you know, we put out some stuff in 2000, a national infrastructure assurance security plan that frankly 50% of it hasn't been executed and we stole ideas from that. So I'd say our 82 recommendations were broadly taken from other things. None of them specifically say, well, if you've done this, it's set, done deal, we won't have um, solar winds. But I do think there were things we had, recommendations we had about improving the threat hunting and the .gov and the ability of CISA to do anomalous activity detection uh, unwarned on other federal agencies, an improved ability to s provide non-reimbursed services to other agencies that could have helped in the earlier detection of this, you know, and uh, and I do think we had recommendations on the supply chain and the supply chain white paper we wrote that specifically address doing a better job uh, ensuring the trustworthiness of our third party vendors in both IT hardware and software. And frankly, we were really more worried about IT hardware Come because it's you know, broadly done outside the United States, as opposed to IT software, where a lot of the work is uh, uh, ostensibly from US companies. So I would not say we would have prevented it. I do think there's a lot of things we did that we, we recommended that could have mitigated the extent of it. If we were lucky, prevented it, and more importantly, allowed for more rapid understanding of what happened and response and support to the private sectors as we go through it. Thanks, Mark. Michael, over to you. Uh, and by the way, audience, we're going to try to get in a few questions at the end. So if you'd like to ask any one of our panelists uh, a pinpoint question, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, Michael, do we fully understand the scope and the scale and the nature of solar wind supply chain compromise yet? Or do you still think it's unfolding? So I don't think we fully understand it yet. Uh, I think there are still other shoes to drop. Uh, there will be other... Uh, in there'll be other organizations that will be identified as suffering from uh, the intrusion. Uh, but even among those that have been identified in the public sector, for example, uh, I am certain that um, we don't have the full scope and understanding of uh, the intrusion, uh, what all the actors behind this, most likely the Russians, uh, what the Russians were able to get, what they were able to exfiltrate. Um, and doing those kinds of damage assessments um, usually takes months, um, multiple months. Um, and it would not be surprising to me if, you know, a year from now, uh, people inside the federal government are still working on the damage assessment from that, um, just based on prior experience with this. And the same thing in the private sector, it takes a long time to understand these things. Um, we do seem to have some indications that right now, almost that this activity is primarily espionage uh, so in other words, it was not aimed at causing destruction or disruption. It was about stealing information for uh, policy purposes. Um, so that is uh, one thing that is good in the sense that it wasn't destructive or disruptive so far. Um, but of course, as we continue to look and try to understand it better, um, that could come out. It does not appear to be economic espionage as of yet. But again, we don't know the full extent of what happened in the private sector. So I would say there's definitely a lot more to, uh, to learn. And I would say even on the technical side, um, we are still learning things about how this intrusion was uh, carried out. I mean, you saw that last week, you know, Microsoft put out some additional information. Symantec has put out some additional uh, research. I know there's some other research that's pending uh, in the community that's gonna come out. So even just from a technical standpoint, um, we're still learning about this intrusion. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. 
John, over to you. Uh, you've got kind of a unique view on this because you work for a leading cybersecurity company, Palo Alto Networks. How is your company involved in SolarWinds incident? And what insight to this threat do you have as a result with, uh, with that uh, viewpoint coming straight from Palo Alto? Yeah, thanks, Casey. Uh, interesting question. Uh, we at Palo Alto Networks have some, what we consider unique insight into the solar storm threat based on the combination of three things. Number one, our threat research team. Number two, our robust operational collaboration with US and partner government cybersecurity agencies. But perhaps most uniquely, number three, through our direct experience in blocking a solar storm attack, one of the only uh, publicly acknowledged organizations to do so. So as one of many, we used to use SolarWinds Orion software for network management. Earlier this past fall, we downloaded a software update from SolarWinds who, as we didn't know at the time, had their supply chain compromised and the software update was compromised, uh, a compromised SolarWinds Orion plugin called Sunburst. That SolarWinds Orion update downloaded a DLL or dynamic link library file with Cobalt Strike, which is a commodity malware routinely used by red teams and pen testers which we thought at the time could be the case in this situation. The Cobalt Strike malware attempted to call out to an adversary controlled uh, control channel uh, server and opened up a communication path known as a named pipe. When that happened, we automatically blocked the malicious executable from running in our own system in mid execution. And we did this using machine learning powered endpoint user behavior analytics. See all the prior steps plus the addition of opening a named pipe that triggered our automatic behavioral threat prevention block in this case. And that then alerted our response team to investigate. Successful completion of the malware execution would have given this adversary access to take additional action like lateral movement uh, and eventually data exfiltration. Our technology recognized that this behavior seemed malicious, even though it was not previously known to be uh, malicious and we blocked it using an existing threat signature, uh, and thus blocked using an existing threat signature. At the time, we didn't have the context for the true nature of this threat, and but we did follow all the best practices for responsible dis disclosure. It wasn't until 13 December that SolarWinds announced that their Orion IT management platform had been compromised in a software supply chain attack. The attack allowed the adversary to insert the back door, which you talked about, starting as early as March of 2020. And this additional context allowed us to go back to our original incident and build out a better picture of what happened. And as we all now know, the SolarWinds Orion users received the backdoored plugin through the official update patching channel. The backdoor was, uh, the code was signed by SolarWinds and laid dormant for up to two weeks after installation, decreasing the chances of detection. At that point, the backdoor activated and gave the attacker control over the SolarWinds server. Using the information from our logs and traditional network defense capabilities, as well as our uh, internal incident response and analysis of our internet facing infrastructure, we were then able to piece together the rest of the story. And we began an immediate deliberate series of outreach engagements with both US and international government cyber uh, operational organizations as well as our clients worldwide in order to share our unique uh, insight into the threat. And as a result of those engagements across this broad swath of public and private organizations, we were then able to build out a more comprehensive situational awareness, awareness of the breadth and depth of this threat, including its tactics, techniques, and procedures, its timeline, and its infrastructure. And with each successive engagement, we learned more at and the more that we learned, we shared more broadly in these various engagements with gov governments and industry organizations in order to try to provide a more complete picture of what happened and continues to happen, as Michael said. This is a continuing uh, evolution. And like Michael mentioned, I, I don't think we've, we totally have the full picture of what happened yet. Okay, John, thank you very much. Uh, Michael. What are the best practices in the industry to defend against supply chain compromises uh, that you can talk about today and how do they need to change? Yeah, so 
you know, the, the truth is that a lot of what you need to do to defend against a supply chain intrusion also apply to a lot of the other kinds of malicious activity that you would face. You know, you want your network architecture to be segmented. You want to have a uh, good understanding of how your network actually operates so you can identify when something is happening that shouldn't be happening, right? You want to be sure that you've got that uh, multi-factor authentication on there so that, um, you know, the, the adversary, when they're trying to set up new accounts and things, have to register devices and therefore potentially, you know, trigger an alert. Um, what you're trying to do in all of these instances is none of them by themselves will guarantee stopping the adversary. But what you're trying to do is create as many opportunities for the adversary to trip up or to have to take a risk, to have to take some sort of move that causes them to expose themselves. Um, and so you want to put in place all of those activities so that over time, um, those risks add up, those opportunities add up, and you have the opportunity to detect the adversary sooner. Um, so that's really what you're trying to, uh, that's what you're really trying to do. So all of those uh, the basic practices that we tell organizations that John would tell, you know, a, a customer or a client that he's, uh, you know, trying to recruit uh, or trying to, you know, uh, engage with that I talk to with industry, all of those apply. Um, specifically, though, the other thing that you can do, and I think that more companies should do this, is they should be asking their vendors uh, and that's the whole point of this, you know, the cybersecurity maturity model that is the subject of this, you know, these sessions today, asking their vendors how they are implementing their cybersecurity practice, practices. How do they ensure the integrity uh, of their systems? And ensuring that not only do you have those practices in place for your organization, but those that are supplying you with network management software or other kinds of IT services that they have good cybersecurity practices. Um, and again, obviously you're not gonna be able to go and you know, inspect all of this. And so there's a certain level of trust that's involved, but even just asking the questions, putting it into the contract and making vendors attest to it would improve the overall security of the ecosystem. Thanks, Michael, excellent. Uh, Mark, we've got a, a question that came in that it follows along Michael's train uh, of thought. Uh, you know, we have a lot of folks in the audience that are DOD or have DOD customers, but we also have a lot of folks in the audience that are non-DOD. So CM CMMC does not really apply to non-DOD folks. What advice do you have for them on uh, protecting themselves, even though CMMC really doesn't apply directly to non-DOD clients? First, I, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of CMMC moving beyond DOD right now. There's a lot of reasons why it fits well in DOD, and there's a lot of linkages through DFARS and others that, that make it appropriate. But that doesn't mean that other, you know, government vendors and suppliers and, um, and contractors don't need to have an appropriate level of cybersecurity assigned to their, uh, a, a, assigned to their products and their processes. So first, there are NIST standards to follow and I'd, I'd follow them. But second, we in the government do owe a better explanation of what we want from them. And I think over time, you're gonna see that. I think there's gonna be a lot of good, look, there's the silver lining to this. If it is indeed a um, espionage event only, I think there's a lot of silver lining to this, which is just focus the Biden administration coming in on doing a lot of the things that um, were recommendations that, the, that were on the tip of the Obama administration's tongue in 2016 and that are in our report. And I think they're picking the right kind of professional people to do it. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, again, this is a tough thing to have a silver lining when you don't know the depth of the, of the problem. It's hard to assign a silver lining. But what I'll say is I do think that this is going to get the, the government talking more about what they need from their, uh, from their, um, uh, vendors and from their providers. And, and it's a slightly different relationship. Not, I mean, the, the DO, there's a reason the DOD budget is 50% of the federal government budget is that we really do buy a lot of really, a lot of stuff. And it uniquely does buy things. Whereas a lot of the rest of the federal government is providing a managerial service to infrastructures. So it is a different, a different kettle of fish. So I, I want to be careful trying to bring over CMMC and rather talk about the idea 
that there are applicable standards that need to be applied. And the government needs to begin to put its finger on the scale a little more of insisting they're followed. And by the way, physician heal thyself. I think a lot of the .gov needs to re-embrace those same standards going forward. So it is, it's different. And, and it's, I don't wanna equate the DIB, the defense industrial base with what goes on with the rest of the government. Excellent, thanks, Mark. John, over to you. Uh, what was uh, further on the uh, the uh, the attack, the breach? What was unique about the Solar Winds incident that you uh, you can fill us in on? Yeah, sure thing, Casey. Um, five reasons. Number one, scale. The Solar Winds has a massive footprint. As you mentioned, over three hundred thousand customers. Ten percent you ten percent using the using Orion and nearly 18,000 may have downloaded the backdoored or malicious solar wind Orion plugin that was called Sunburst. Number two, stealth. The Sunburst backdoor was injected into a legitimate solar winds Orion plugin. It was digitally signed by solar winds. It waited one to two weeks before performing DNS requests. When it generated command and control traffic, it mimicked the legitimate solar winds Orion update protocol. Uh, three, privilege. SolarWinds Orion often has access to important systems because it's used for agency or enterprise-wide network system management. Uh, number four, dwell time. The initial versions of Sunburst were deployed in March, uh, giving this adversary months of undetected access. And then five, the adversary uh, itself. Although we rarely engage in attribution because we're not sitting on any adversary in infrastructure and only use what we know from our sensors across our public and private sector customer base worldwide, we suspect this was a nation state level threat organization, likely focused, as Michael said, on obtain obtaining privileged long-term access in the network. The reconnaissance, the setting up of domains through auctions and seasoning them to look benign, uh, all the rest of the infrastructure disguised to make everything from credentials to certificates look authentic, this indicates by what we know, at least six months prior to March 2020, and probably even longer before, longer uh, than that, uh, this was a work of a very patient, persistent, and advanced adversary, as the term APT would suggest. And Excellent, John. If I thank can just, thank you if I can just yes, add sir. on to that, too, um, the level of stealth uh, involved in um, in the activities, including the way that uh, the Cobalt, uh, John mentioned the Cobalt Strike tool, the way that uh, the second stage malware was compiled um, was almost unique to each one of the targeted uh, entities. I mean, that's a level of stealth that, I mean, you almost never see that kind of uh, attention to detail and willingness to take the time to, uh, to do that. And I would also argue that it shows an organizational level of capacity that in addition to the technology, the targeting and the care with which um, the, the victims were uh, selected, um, that it bespeaks of, a, of an organizational level of capacity that you also rarely see. Uh, so there are just a lot of things that really make this a, you know, th this will be a case study uh, for many, many cybersecurity programs for years to come. If I could just add to, to that, sure. don't forget about the timing associated with this. An election year, the beginning of a pandemic turmoil and the associated economic uh, instability associated with all of that. I mean, you put all that together and I think it speaks towards uh, Michael's point very well. Okay, John, you opened the can of worms on this. Uh, Mark, I've got to ask you the next question. Uh, John made an excellent point. What's going on in the big picture? You know, the, there's an election year, there's all this stuff, a pandemic, all that. Mark, what is, what is the gray zone? Can you tell us what that is and why that's the bigger picture and how cybersecurity, cybersecurity fits into the gray zone? So, uh, um... It is important to discuss the gray zone and it's important to discuss espionage. I would say the espionage predates the, you know, our thinking about the gray zone. So we, we do have to be careful here, but I would say, um, and by the way, in, I think 
I don't know that John or, or uh, Michael want to talk to it, but I think as, as companies are looking to this, they're finding some other penetrations that might not be espionage, you know, as companies are starting to really dig into their, um, into their, uh, into their networks. But so the great, what, what we were concerned about in the gray zone as a commission is the idea that, that while deterrence may have worked generally in cyberspace uh, at the above the level of use of force, in other words, we didn't see Russia or China, and we didn't in this, we haven't in this case yet, you know, damaging or debilitating or uh, our, uh, our, our network, our electrical power, water, um, transportation networks. You know, I think the idea that we have a very capable kinetic and non-kinetic, not kinetic and non-kinetic retaliation capability has kind of prevented those kind of attacks to date. And it will right up to the point where a country actually uses them to as the first strike in a, you know, to facilitate a, 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 a action against us. What we haven't been able to prevent is a whole litany of behavior below the use of force and the, the intellectual property theft that the Blair Commission documented uh, uh, over several decades period, the OPM data theft, um, North Korea's attack on Sony, all these things kind of happened below the use of force where it, it'd be, they, people would become comfortable with the fact that the United States would not as a nation state respond overtly or, or with a kinetic or non-kinetic reply. And, uh, and so, and again, I wanna leave espionage out of this for a second and just say that that, that be, has become unacceptable to us. This kind of death of the thousand cuts or the establishing of a higher and higher level which you can cause cyber pain to us without responding, I think we, we've reached that point. And we've reached it with non-state actors as well. I think, you know, the kind of criminal behavior that's going on is, you know, there's be companies are beginning, companies that historically did not invest the right amount in cybersecurity are realizing that because of the monetization of data, they're going to need to do that. So I would say that the gray zone, the, the United States is, is kind of orienting, bringing the aircraft carrier around slowly to, fo you know, to begin to operate in, in the gray zone. And I think you see that a little bit with with uh, you see that with persistent engagement and defend forward, but you also see it with the idea that and understanding that we actually have to defend our networks. Cyber deterrence. It, there's this argument going on: is it offense? Is it defense? I think almost everyone who really sits down and thinks about it would say honestly, it's both. And you know, we really have to invest in defense. Now, here's the problem: since 1944, at least, and maybe you go all the way back to the War of 1812, the United States has had the luxury of not defending its critical infrastructure. You know, we weren't we weren't at risk in our electrical power grids or our roads or anything, because the only weapons that could have hit us nuclear weapons, we had a whole different deterrence mechanism with with mutual assured destruction. You know, very quickly, cyber has removed that geographic benefit to the United States, and we actually have to defend things. So whereas if you went through Germany in the 1970s, you saw Hawk and IHawk missile batteries spread all over their countries, you know, both US and NATO. You didn't see those in the United States. Well, now we actually have to defend things. So you're seeing this investment. So what I'd say is what, what it means to, to, to operate in that gray zone is we have to invest in our defense. We have to build, and because the defense is a lot of its owned by the private sector, we have to build that collaboration. And then we have to maintain the off, a credible offensive capability uh, and, operate, and operate in a gray zone with that capability to both detect and kind of diffuse or defeat uh, adversary efforts. Uh, again, and I would set espionage completely aside from this because espionage has happened since before we thought of the gray zone. And in fact, I, I would say one thing, Senator Romney's very smart man has very, I think, inappropriately described this as like, you know, thousands of Russian bombers flying over our country every day. That's not what this was. This was thousands of Russian spies walking through uh, the halls of our government and our businesses with memory sticks, downloading hardware grabbing an Aeroflot flight back to Russia, coming back the next day and doing it all over again for nine months, except the Aeroflot flight took three microseconds, not 13 hours. And it was this constant thing. That's what we saw happen. It's unacceptable, but it's not bombers flying over your country. Excellent. Uh, for the audience, uh, the gray zone, a quick definition of the gray zone is all methods short. It's, it's operating between peace and war and it's using all methods short of conventional war to weaken your adversary. So um, over to you, uh, Michael, I want to ask you, why isn't uh, our US government responding more aggressively to this uh, solar winds intrusion? 
Well, I think there are several uh, points to go along with that. I mean, one is, as uh, we were just discussing, so far it looks like um, espionage. Um, and if it is, you know, espionage, then we do espionage too. And um, we would very happily collect as much information as we possibly could. That's why we have a very robustly uh, re resourced and active intelligence community. Um, and so I think, now, as Mark said, that doesn't mean that you have to sit there on your hands. There are things that you can do, and I think that the Biden administration will start to do them, um, but it does shape how you have to respond to uh, this kind of activity. And again, as long as, and, you know, if we're staying in this realm of espionage, um, you know, some of what you would expect the U.S. government to be doing is sending diplomatic messages to the Russians. You would... Um, in the long tradition of espionage, you would probably do what's called PNG, some diplomat. That stands for persona non grata. You'd basically kick out some Russians from, uh, you know, from the United States. You would throw sand in the gears at the UN and in other international bodies for things that the Russians want. Um, you would do all sorts of things to signal your, uh, your displeasure. And the other thing I would be signaling um, very strongly, potentially even using, uh, for example, the cyber hotline, uh, that was set up uh, back under the Obama administration is to be delivering that met is to be delivering a message that says, and if we discover that this activity in fact went beyond espionage, if in fact it actually involved economic espionage, if it involved you leaving little surprises behind for us in networks, we will retaliate for that. In other words, I would be recommending that we you know be laying out some very clear uh, some very clear lines there. Um, and I think you're going to uh, to see more of that. Of course, I think the other issue is that, um, you know, during a transition, I mean, this, you know, we discovered this came to light, you know, right as, you know, we were heading into a transition, even under the best of transitions, like, you know, transition, like the transition we had from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. Even under the best of those transitions, you have disruption in government capacity to deal with policy issues. And this transition was far from the best uh, transition. In fact, it might actually rank as one of the worst. So, you know, it's not surprising that, um, you know, it's taking time for the new administration to figure out exactly how, um, how, it, wants to, uh, how it wants to respond. Excellent. Uh, thank you. John, over to you. Uh, what are some strategic takeaways or lessons from your experience with this solar winds thus, uh, thus far? And we know that it's still evolving. Yeah, thanks, Casey. Uh, wow, I have some strong feelings about the discussion that both Mark and Michael just had, but uh, mostly in support of what they said. But I'm just going to take the perspective of Palo Alto Networks and a cybersecurity company looking at this thing based on what we've done. Um, I'd characterize our efforts since the week of 8 December as doing all we can to be good partners to governments and and customers globally by sharing our unique insight into the threat based on our own experience, uh, as well as the, our continuing engagements as the, the picture evolves. Uh, two big takeaways, and, and I, don't, I don't think this is gonna, these are not gonna be novel for anybody, but I think it's worth emphasizing as a result of, of doing what we've done. Number one, we have a very long way to go with effective cyber threat uh, intelligence and information sharing, and I'm sure Michael has a lot to say about this lesson, given he's probably forgotten more about cyber threat intel sharing than I've ever learned. But from our engagements, it's been clear that everyone was looking through soda straws. And because this threat had and continues to have different infrastructure for different targets, at least after the initial common threat vector of the supply chain injection and the subsequent call out to what seemed like a benign domain, this means that only by effectively sharing intel across the various organizations that have been impacted can we gain a complete picture and enable a more coordinated strategic response. Of course, we were looking through our own stovepipes initially, but as we engaged with other partners, other nations, state and local and education officials and clients, we broadened that view and provided it as well to overcome stovepipes. As I mentioned, it wasn't until the 13th of December that SolarWinds announced their compromise, and this is the context that allowed us to go back 
and take a look at what we experienced more than two months earlier. And as I mentioned earlier, then build out a better picture using information from our logs and traditional network defense capabilities in order to piece together the rest of the story. And then we began this deliberate series of outreach engagements. As a result of our engagements across this, you know, all these public and private organizations, we built out this more comprehensive situational awareness of the breadth and depth of the threat. And as mentioned before, we learn more with each successive engagement. This highlights the importance to me of information and, int and intelligence sharing across the ecosystem. And what we have today is clearly not sufficient for the speed and scale required to deal with cyber threats of any type, let alone a sophisticated APT like this one. Everybody's not only looking through soda straws, but fighting through so soda straws, resulting in a very fragmented effort and ineffective results. We've got to do better here as a public-private partnership. The lack of this will continue to cripple a more strategic response, and it'll leave us looking through and fighting through soda straws. The second takeaway, and again, this is not new, but it's going to reinforce several important aspects, takes a comprehensive cybersecurity approach to deal with these kinds of threats. Number one, traditional network defense, including logs, were necessary but insufficient because, because of the legitimate updates, legitimate credentials, trusted downloads. These, these things all bypassed traditional defenses. But you needed all that to enable the next important function, the importance of incident response, hunting, forensics. These functions are necessary to find, fix, and remediate, and then secure. And uh, finally, and this is very important, automation and software-based advanced analytics. In this case, automated behavior analytics at the endpoint enabled us to prevent malware execution in our own infrastructure. Remember that even though we could enable a signature-based traditional de defense from the information we gleaned from our incident response, those signatures, I think like Michael described earlier, largely became useless because in this case, this adversary quickly began to clean up after themselves and move on to additional unique infrastructure to go after other targets and they continue to do so. So the signatures were no longer preventing anything for us or helping other organizations that we might be, that might be being pursued uh, by different threat uh, infrastructure with no signature. So the bottom line was to fight modern cyber threats, especially sophisticated state actors, visibility and enforcement across all the steps in the attack process, I would argue including supply chain and insider threats because even those types of threats still have to advance through additional C2, privileged access escalation, and lateral movement before they can execute a successful outcome. So visibility and enforcement across the kill chain are critical, but even more importantly, they have to inform each other automatically. They've gotta be integrated to work together through automation to break down the stovepipes or soda straw approach that's you know, tripping up a more strategic and effective response. And finally, I'd argue that the zero trust approach is critical for segmentation, visibility, and granular control over users and their, their identity, applications, content data, devices, and even processes. Like in this case for us, this named pipe rule for the behavioral threat prevention that we successfully used to essentially trap the malware in our infrastructure and remove it as a threat. So it takes all of this and that's, that's the direction that we need to move to as a community of public-private entities. Excellent, thank you, John, for that. Uh, to the audience, we've included your questions in, uh, in my questions. Uh, most of those questions were, were loaded with your questions. Um, I'd like to summarize by saying thank you very much to the panel that uh, you've taken your time out of the day today. Um, but before we do that, let's leave a couple of things uh, we, we need to do better. What we've been doing in the past and doing the same thing year after year is not working. We've got to do better. Uh, all the speakers said we need to do a much better job at the uh, public-private partnership, uh, which also includes all of our free world allies. There's a bigger picture here that Mark discovered, that Mark, uh, not discovered, Mark explained. And a key factor is in cybersecurity, this has to be at the CEO's desk it's got to be led by the CEO. It's got to be led by the chairman of the board or the agency director. 
because the damage that it can do now, they don't understand the threat there. They don't understand the risk. And by the way, when we're speaking to CEOs and chairmen and agency directors, they only, they only understand things in word in like the three R's. Well, it's the two R's, revenue and risk. But anyway, um, thank you very much audience for your time. I'd like to thank our panel. You guys uh, are outstanding in what you're doing in the fight for our country and being at the tip of the spear. And thank you very much for your time today. Over.